Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. So, Daniel 7, 13 through 14. Daniel 7, 13 through 14. Let me open us with prayer before we start going into uh, chapter 5. Lord, give us your wisdom and your insight during this time. Make this the living word that has transforming influence on us. Uh, help us see the truths that you want us to see that you have put into this section of scripture and uh, illuminate our minds and hearts as we study this. In Christ's name, amen. So we're going to take the first half of chapter 5. Next week we'll take the second half and then, of course, we'll take chapter 6, and then we transition. Because the book, as I said early on in the introduction, the first, the first six chapters are historical chapters. The last uh, six chapters are prophetic chapters. Are and we doing this in a chronological order? We're do, well, the first six are pretty much in a chronological order. But the last six are not in a chronological order. There's no chronological order that's obvious in the set in the last in the last part of the last six chapters. That you can't put them in a necessarily in a context of when Daniel received these, and you know. So it, it's it's not it's not linear like the first six are more linear. So okay. Now, let's read verses 1 through 4 of chapter 5 and talk about this part first. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of, of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, in order that the king and his nobles his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze and iron, wood and stone. Now, let's set this First, in a historical context, who is Belshazzar? And there's controversy. There has been controversy over probably well over 100 years about this passage. And I'll tell you what the controversy is. Well, so, he's a grandson of Neb? That's what I think the best understanding is, yes. Now, after the death of Nebuchadnezzar in 562-563, we see a series of Babylonian kings over the next 23 years. Now, the full list, starting even one step before Nebuchadnezzar, is, is as follows. Nebuchadnezzar's father was Neoplazer. Uh -huh. okay, he reigned from 526 to 605 BC, at which point he died, Nebuchadnezzar was then made king. This is when he traveled, because he died, he traveled. Yes, back. he was in, he, he fought the Battle of Carchemish against Pharaoh Necho and the Assyrians. He beat them. At the end of that battle, he hears his father has died. He runs back to, to Chaldea, to Babylon, is installed. And then, of course, ends up sending his army back for the first exile wave of, uh, <clears throat> of Jerusalem. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is the longest in his reign. He reigns from 605 to 562, approximately 562 B.C. He dies, and one of his sons takes over. He's called Evil Merodach. <laughs> Uh, he reigns for exactly two years. Turn to uh, 2 Kings 25. I want to show you that the Bible is a great historical document, not only just a, uh, a spiritual document, a spiritual truth. So 2 Kings 25. 
and we're going to look at verses 27 through 30. Now, remember, Jehoiakim is a puppet king that's placed in Jerusalem after the first exile occurs. And it says, now it came about, no, I think Jehoiakim actually takes with him back. But Jehoiakim, he takes back, he is the king, he takes back with him back to Babylon, I think is what happens. But uh, we'll read 27. Now it came about, in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of that month, that evil Merodach, now we see our guy here, we, we read about him in, in Babylonian history, we see his name repeatedly there, we see the same name here in the Bible. Uh, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in, the, in that year he became the king, he released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. So he had him locked up. It says, and he spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the kings who were uh, with him in Babylon. And Jehoiakim changed his prison clothes, had his meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life, and allowance was given to him. So what, what really is said here is that evil Merodach decides that He's going to try to ingratiate himself to the Jewish to the Jewish exiles at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's his strategy. Now the next person that comes to power after Evil Merodach, because Evil Merodach is murdered in 560 BC. There's a lot of instability going on here during this 23 years. The person who takes over then for a matter of four years, is Nergal Shar Usar. You will see him mentioned if you want to jump to the right, past Isaiah to Jeremiah. Go to towards the end, verse 39 of chapter 39 of Jeremiah. 39. And we're going to read verses 2 and 3 speaking about King Zedekiah, he says, in the 11th year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city wall was breached. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came in and sat down at the middle gate. See who he first mentions here, Nergal Sar Ezer. This is our guy, okay? And then he talks about some of the other officials that also were with him. And, of course, they come in because they're surveying uh, Jerusalem at this point. So he only lasts four years, and he dies in 556. Now, a, another person takes over in the lineage. His name is Labashi Marduk. He is a younger person. I forget what they said he was, something like 16 years old. Apparently, nobody liked him much at all, nor respected him, and within two months, he's murdered. Wait, they didn't like him, and they took him out? Yep, there, were, there was a whole lot of assassinations that went on during this time, in these 23 years. Finally, a, a person who marries, apparently, the, one of the granddaughters of Nebuchadnezzar, named Nabonidus, takes over power. He starts his reign in 556, and he actually rules literally until the conquest of Babylon in 539. Now, the interesting thing in the criticism that has occurred, and I, I want you to know this because if you read any about the fifth chapter, there are many people, particularly in the liberal persuasion of uh, commentaries that state that there's a historical misstatement made here because they claim that Belshazzar was never the king, Nabonidus was the king. But what we find is that Nabonidus uh, indeed uh, was the king, but he made his son Belshazzar co-regent with him. Now, I want to read you 
a little bit of information about this. It's from this uh, uh, article that I found. Here's the following. As early as 1861, H.F. Talbot published a cuneiform, tab a cuneiform tablet found at Ur containing the name Belshazzar. In 1882, the excavations of Theophilus Pinches published the famous Nabonidus Chronicle. It was a clay tablet that was dictated by King Nabonidus, the father of Belshazzar, okay? And it correctly infers that the crown prince, that would be Belshazzar, was, quote, regarded as king because he was left in full control of the army in Babylon from at least 549 to 544, 545 BC. Actually, there's some other documents that suggest that he was left in control for 10 years. Nabonidus was establishing at this time a new military and commercial fortress in Tiama, which is in, in northwest Saudi Arabia. He was had some conquests going on. He was also building more temples to more Babylonian gods in and around the ex extended parts of the empire. He apparently was literally not in Babylon, Nabonidus, for nearly 10 years. So, Nab so Belshazzar, in his stead, takes over. So in, he wasn't the only king, but indeed he was installed as the effective king during this 10-year period of time. Was Nabonidus, Nab Nabonidus. Um, Nebuchadnezzar's son? Yes. Okay. He was. No. Um, no, he was not. He was his son-in-law. He was okay. He was a son he was married to one of of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. Okay. Yeah. And so um, Belshazzar would have been a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, we also see in 1916, the archaeologist Pinches published two legal documents dated from the 12th and 13th years of Nabonidus, which record oaths sworn by the life of Nabonidus, the king, and Belshazzar, quote, his crown prince. We also, of course, have a very famous document, which is called the Nabonidus Cylinder, which exists today in the British Museum, which again talks about the transfer of kingship temporarily during his 10-year absence while he was gone doing his exploits in Saudi Arabia. So originally, you know, the, the Bible, of course, was stated as being historically wrong in this, as, of course, we've done more archaeological digging and found more tablets, etc. We found that it's absolutely exactly right. What it says is indeed completely accurate. All right, now, <clears throat> Belshazzar, of course, lacked tr the true leadership skills of his father, and he really lived off the legacy of his father and his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. We, of course, see this event which occurs that we read about in the first four verses, and that is Belshazzar decides to have a great party for a thousand officials. And of course, in the process of the party, they become increasingly more drunk, which is literally what the Aramaic implies in the language. I think we see here a trend that is historically a trend through history and empire after empire. That is, as governments become more corrupt, Officials become more self-serving. Re recreation takes the place of genuine public service. I think this is the pattern of almost all great empires that have occurred and indeed fallen. And it shows again that human beings have an amazing inability to learn the lessons of history. Now, it's interesting what's going on here. 
the Bible has its focus in chapter 5 on what's going on in this great banquet hall. But there's actually things going on outside the banquet hall that the Bible is not focusing on, but we have historical documents that tell us about these things. Is that when the maids came in? And... Right. Now, this is a quote from the Greek, histor Greek historian Herodias, who is one of our famous and, we believe, most accurate historians of ancient history. Herodias, by the way, literally went and saw Babylon within 100 years after this time. He was there, and he actually says that it's the largest ancient city that he'd ever seen, and it was absolutely the most spectacular city that he'd ever seen, literally, on the face of the earth. So he saw it within 100 years of this time. It's interesting because the Medea Persians did not tear down Babylon. They just took it over. So there wasn't much destruction that went on by them in the, in the process. Now, there is a military and political leader of Cyrus, the Medea Persian. His name is Gabarus. He and his staff, quote, are in view of the revelry. It would not, I'm quoting, it would not be at all surprising if the gates, he says, leading to the palace were open for all the city is feasting this night. Quote, then at the beginning of the following spring, Cyrus marches against Babylon. The Babylonians sallied out and awaited him. And when he came near their city in his march, they engaged him, but they were beaten and driven inside the city. There they had stored provisions for as many as 20 years' time. Remember, they've got the Euphrates River, they've got provisions, and they've got land inside this very large city that they can also grow crops, okay? They, they, uh, because of this, uh, Cyrus was, was not a man of no, bit, of no ambition and saw that he attacked all nations, and saw that he attacked all nations alike, so now, they were, they were indifferent to his siege. Eventually, the Persians took, took them unaware, and because of the great size of the city, those in the outer parts of it were overcome, but the inhabitants in the middle part knew nothing of it. All this time, they were dancing and celebrating a holiday, which happened to fall then, until they learned the truth only too well that they'd been taken over. This is Herodotus. Now, this, this feast is called the Feast of Shakamayan. It seems to have been an anniversary feast since, according to both Xenophon, who was a Greek historian, and Herodotus, Cyrus knew of it beforehand, either on account of the king's birthday or in honor of his gods, particularly the god Shak, which, of course, was why it's called Shock, uh, shock, shock anon. We see references to it actually mentioned in Jeremiah 51, verse 14. So, apparently, there were several reasons for this great feast. Okay? First of all, it was a feast time. Secondly, as Herodotus stated, they literally, the Persians, the Dea Persians literally came to the north end. They, stay, they came around and partly surround the city, okay? The gates had been pulled up. There's the Euphrates, and there's the ziggurat, the, the, the small, what's left of the Tower of Babel, and the palace, okay? What happened is they took part of their troops and moved them up here, and they put part of their troops and put them down the river. They were very visibly seen. It wasn't that they were taken by surprise, but rather, and you'll see, I'm going to go on and tell you. So we also see about this palace area. In 1899, Cold Dewey excavated this palace, this great hall, and 
found that it was 54 feet wide and over 175 feet long with 20 foot thick walls in the interior, all plastered in gypsum. This is what he discovered in 1899 when he found this place, okay? Literally, the palace was probably no more than 100 or 150 feet from where the Persians were literally camped against the wall. There was a double wall system around Babylon, okay? They were so convinced with the double wall system, the gates, the height of the walls, uh, the, the ability to control the gates through the bridges, etc., they believed they were impregnable. And so when the, when the Median Persians, you know, came and camped out against them, they did nothing. As a matter of fact, Herodotus makes a statement that the way this thing happened, if the Babylonians had come out and put their troops on the top of these walls, when the Persian, the Dea Persians had split into two groups, they could have literally rained down arrows, spears, and all kinds of stuff, them being trapped inside. But they never did. And the soul of the world dropped. Yeah. So the point is, this is another example of unbelievable arrogance on the part of Belshazzar. He didn't take Cyrus seriously. He didn't take anything seriously. So he decided to have a, a party of a thousand individuals where they got increasingly more drunk. All right? Now, it's also interesting, and I'm not going to go into this, but in 1968, Saddam Hussein spent several years redoing this palace and restored it to pretty much its original archaeological state. He also, over the years, rebuilt other parts of ancient Babylon up until the, what was it, the, when, when was he captured? 90 what? I forget now. I can't remember when he was so captured. Somewhere about the end of the yeah, whenever it was, and so that ended. I don't know that Iraq has done more building or restoration of ancient Babylon at this point or not, but they have done some, and it still is partly restored as of today. So it's interesting. Of course, Saddam Hussein viewed himself as an ancestor of Nebuchadnezzar. Oh. Yeah, you know, he did. He thought he was the, almost the reincarnation. Now, both the historians Herodotus and Xiophon state that Cyrus began his conquest in the spring of 539. He started out by going upstream, or downstream, I'm sorry, upstream, and of course, he built a canal system right off the Euphrates, and he built it and emptied it and made an artificial lake. He then gated it, okay? And then in the fall of that year was when he sends his army in to invade. A matter of hours before his army invades, they open up the gate of the canal, okay? They therefore drain part of the Euphrates River into the lake, and he marches his army down the, the Euphrates, according to Herodotus, no more than hip deep, okay? There were bronze gates that were in the Euphrates, all right, that they'd set up to try to, again, keep people from being able to come in through the river, but the river was so low they could get under the gates. So literally, on October 12th of 539 B.C., Cyrus's troops marched into Babylon during this drunken revelry, and literally, it wasn't until morning that most people in Babylon realized that the Medea Persians had taken the city over. It was literally almost a bloodless coup or, or, or battle. And at that point, they were all taken over. And of course, Belshazzar was executed. Wouldn't you have thought they would have known this lake was being dug? They didn't, the point is, they were so arrogant, they didn't care. They did no reconnaissance. They did no defensive maneuvers. They did not, they, they believed they could sit inside Babylon and no one could touch them. That was the attitude that Belshazzar had. 
So it's uh, very, I want you to turn to Jeremiah 51, because I just told you the events that occurred the night of April, or April, October 12th of 539. So turn to Jeremiah 51, and I want to show you how incredibly accurately prophetic the scripture is. So first, we're going to read verse 47, and then we're going to drop down to verse 52 and following. In, verse, in Jeremiah 51, 47, it says, Therefore, behold, days are coming when thou shalt punish the idols of Babylon, and her whole land will be put to shame, and all her slain will fall in her midst. This prediction the downfall. Now drop down to 52. Now listen carefully to what Jeremiah predicts. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they'll punish her idols. What is it that they're worshiping that very night inside the banquet hall? Mm -hmm. yeah, the idols of Babylon. Okay? And the mortally wounded will groan throughout her land. Though Babylon should ascend to the heavens, that is, the essence of the Tower of Babel. And though she should fortify her lofty stronghold, as we've just seen here, when we look at this, from me, destroyers will come to her. Isn't that interesting? From me, destroyers will come to her, declares the Lord. The sound of an outcry from Babylon and of great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans. For the Lord is going to destroy Babylon and he will make her loud noise vanish from her. And their waves will roar like many waters. The tumult of their voices sounds forth. For the destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men will be captured. Their bows will be shattered, and the Lord, uh, and the Lord is a God of recompense, and he will fully repay. Now read 57. And I shall make her princes and her wise men drunk, her governors and her prefects and her mighty men, that they may sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, declares the king whose name is the Lord of hosts. <laughs> so how precise, more precise can you be? He even tells exactly the condition of all of the thousands that's going to occur the very night that they're taken over. Yes? About how many years was uh, Jeremiah made his prediction before it happened? Uh, Jeremiah was contemporaneous, pretty much contemporaneous with Daniel, I believe. I could check here quickly. Um, so it wouldn't have been a long, long time before. Let's, let me see. The, the approximate date that Jeremiah lived was from 627 to 585. So actually, he would have, it would have been almost, a, yeah, about almost a 50, 45 years, about 45 years-ish, he predicted before this occurred. 45, 50 years, yeah. So isn't that remarkable? It is. Unbelievably precise. All right, now, we see that not only, of course, does Belshazzar demonstrate ineptitude and arrogance, but of course, he does one further thing that completely seals his fate. And that is in his drunkenness, he calls for the Jewish temple gold service to be brought to the hall. They had a large museum. They had a large, I'm not certain exactly where it is over here, but outside it was a large museum area where they kept gold and silver and precious articles in their conquests of different empires. They accumulated them. There was, uh, there was a quite large ancient museum that they had, had built there. Now, what happens, of course, is that he has these elements of the temple service, particularly the gold relics, brought. Uh, into the, the, the banquet hall and decides to use them to fill up wine so they could get drunk from 
the temple service and so that they could praise the gods of their own Babylonians, the gods of iron and gods of silver and gods of and all the things that it mentions there. Now, this, of course, I think brings up an interesting question that I wanted you to ponder. I thought about it myself for a while. And that is, of all the things that were in this museum, why did they bring those forth? They could have brought Egyptian stuff they captured. They could have brought, you know, uh, uh, Assyrian stuff they captured. Why did they pick these to bring? A little mocking of the Jewish God. Okay. Is it possible that it had been about the time of the week festival of weeks of tabernacles? Late October. We could look it up, but of course this happened the night of the 12th, so it's got to be close to the feast. Well, you know, it's, it's back there, that was a big feast in Israel. That was a big, big celebration, mm -hmm. kind of like our Thanksgiving, our time of the year after harvest. So I'm wondering if they're picking up on that thing. Maybe Jewish ones were more picky. Yeah. <laughs> could be. Now, there's another thought I had. I think it's fairly clear that at the end of his life, Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, got saved. I think he repented. He declared God, the God of heaven and of earth. He submitted to him as a result of a seven-year period of time. He elevated Daniel. Daniel obviously was very high up in the administration of Babylon. He was obviously a very trusted person, okay? Now, one of the things that we realize as we go on in these verses, and we'll get here in a few minutes, is that Daniel was quite absent from this event. Not that he would want to be part of it, but it seems as we go into the future verses, they're not even quite certain exactly where he is, okay, because they have to summon and find him, all right? I think that like many cultures, when the light of the gospel and the light of God is shown, it isn't too many generations until there's a pushback. And you end up not only with decreased belief, but you end up with anti-belief. Mm -hmm. Are we not seeing that in our own culture? Mm -hmm. yeah. We've moved from a Christian culture to what probably in the 80s maybe we could call a post-Christian culture, to what I think we have to call now to a massive extent an absolute anti-Christian culture. I mean, it's so in the face of God and his standards, you know, in every imaginable way. It's like they can't do enough to rub in the face of God and the Bible, you know, what they're doing. And I think it's, it's also a possible motivation of what was going on here with Belshazzar and his group. You know? So are both of the kings killed with Dar and his family? And says there is no Dar. Mm -hmm. Period. Okay. And everything about God was a little bit. Yeah. But I, I do find it very interesting that of all the things they could have chosen to do, this is what they chose to do. And of course, this absolutely sealed their fate. Now let me show you why it sealed their fate. Oh, by the way, one other thing, back to Back to Daniel, um, I want to make another mention of something that might, some people have been confused by. It says that, um, it's in verse 2, he says, he gives orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple. You're going to hold it. Belshazzar is not the son of Nebuchadnezzar. But what you learn in the Aramaic, the Aramaic lacks a word for grand. They don't have a word for that. So you can be the first generation from your father or the second generation from your father or the third generation from your father, but they don't have a word that just, so you're all considered the son of your father, okay? That's why it's said that way. 
Uh, was his grandfather. Yes, right? correct. So Abraham was considered the father, you know. That's right. Father Abraham. Father Abraham, correct. The father of the Jews. Exactly right. All right. Now, turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 18. I want to show you something to give you a hint back in the Torah of how serious it was what these people were doing. They were absolutely playing with fire when they did this. Turn to Deuteronomy 18 and let's read Numbers. Numbers. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Numbers 18. I turned to Numbers and said Deuteronomy. So it's Numbers 18 and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. This is a special statement made about the duties of the priests as opposed to the other Levites. So, so the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's household with you shall bear the guilt in connection with the sanctuary. In other words, you're going to be responsible for all the things I tell you to do or not do. And you and your sons with you shall bear the guilt in connection with your priesthood. But bring with you and your brothers the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may be joined with you and serve you while you and your sons with you are before the tent of the testimony. And they shall thus attend to your obligation and the obligation of all the tent. Notice this. But they shall not come near to the furnishings or of the sanctuary and of the altar, lest both they and you die. Only special priests were allowed to handle the elements inside the tabernacle in very special prescribed ways. And if you just were of the tribe of Levi, but not specifically of the, one of the priestly elements of it, and you went and did this, zing. That's what happened when David was moving the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, exactly. It, it really only literally could have been moved correctly by special priests. So, Knowing that is true in Israel, can you imagine the implication of what's going on when these people take all the temple service and start to do this with it? So what are they guilty of? Well, first of all, they're guilty of handling the temple service as Gentiles to begin with. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they're using them blasphemously to facilitate a very decadent party let me assure you the implication of the Aramaic is they were doing more than just drinking. Because yeah. <laughs> the concubines and yeah. the wives were there. This was a sexual party also. <laughs> yeah, this was an X-rated party. And also, of course, they were using them to make toast to their own gods. So they are absolutely doing in the face of Yahweh at this point. Now, turn over with numbers, turn back over to the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 50. All right. I just went too far, sorry. And we're going to look at verse 2 of Jeremiah 50. He says, um, He says, the, Lord which, the word which the Lord spoke concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, through Jeremiah the prophet, declare and pro proclaim among the nations, Proclaim it and lift up a standard. Do not conceal it, but say, Babylon has been captured. Bel, one of their main gods, has been put to shame. Marduk, one of their other main gods, has been shattered. Her images have been put, uh, put to shame. Her idols have been shattered. For a nation shall come forth up against her out of the north and will make her land 
uh, and objects of horror, and there will be no inhabitant in it. Both man and beast have wandered off, etc. So he says he's going to attack not only Babylon, he's going to attack the gods of Babylon. Mm-hmm. All right? Now, that, I was... I was Jeremiah 50 verses 1 and 2, and, okay. and uh, yeah, 1 and 2. Now turn to the New Testament, because Paul gives us even more insight about this. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul here tells it exactly the way it is. Verse 4. Therefore, concerning the eat, eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no there, there is no there is no one uh, there is no God but one. And then he goes on, of course, and he later says here that those that would eat to idols are rather eating to demons, to demons. So what they're practicing is the worship of demons in these idols that they're, you know, honoring at this point. So turn back now to Daniel, chapter 5, and let's read verses 5 through 12 and see what's going on in these verses. Here's where it gets interesting. Suddenly, the fingers of the man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall. Notice how he says there's plaster on the wall. Mm -hmm. What is it that the archaeologist found on the wall when he investigated? Jimson stone was all on the wall, used as plaster, white jimson, okay? He says, opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. The king called out aloud, bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read the inscription and explain its interpretation to me will be clothed with purple, have a necklace of gold around his neck, and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even more pale, and his nobles were perplexed. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Don't let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There's a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, that would be actually his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, illumination, insight, and wisdom, uh, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And that King Nebuchadnezzar, your father or grandfather, the king uh, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, and Chaldeans, and the diviners. This was because of an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Well, I think he must have known a little bit about Daniel, but he had no interest in Daniel. I think that's the point. He had Jesus and nothing to him. I don't think he had any concern for him. He, right. he, he, things were going his way. He was living off the legacy of the others. Things were stable because of his father, Nabonidus. He had plenty of money. He had plenty of, you know, his glory of the city, etc. Now, it's interesting that an armless hand okay, shows up and a finger of that hand inscribes these words. Now, I find that very provocative. I want you to turn to Exodus 31. 
This is not the first time we've seen a hand and a finger. Exodus 31. Verse 18, here is what's said about Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, the first set. And when he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, the Lord gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Drop over to the next chapter, chapter 32. Look at verses 15 and 16. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Okay, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and on the other. And the tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Isn't it interesting? God decides to use his, quote, finger to inscribe the first set of the Ten Commandments on tablets. But Moses didn't freak out. No. <laughs> well. He wasn't telling him the same thing. Yeah, that's true. It was a different message here, you know. Now, go back to Daniel chapter, chapter 5. So we see here that there's a hand, but there's no arm, and a finger, or fingers, but one finger is writing this unusual set of words that no one can interpret. Next week, we're going to go into what they are, and I'm going to tell you why it's likely that no one but Daniel could interpret them. Now, it's interesting. Notice what's said here. The king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began to knock together. The phrase, the hip joints went slack, is a very pleasant way to say what actually happened to him. That is, he had, let's say nicely, urinary and bowel incontinence. <laughs> to put it in terms Mike might understand, he crapped his pants. <laughs> That's what <laughs> that's what the text actually says in the Aramaic. Okay? That's right. So now it's interesting. The cause of scholars, and of course, no one can interpret this message. They have been very useful for many things as we go along here. Now, why do you think it is that he offers? Anyone who can interpret this, the third place in the kingdom. Because his dad reigned and he reigned, and so the next thing is third. The only open place was third. It's another proof of the truth that Nabonidus was the first. He, he was in the position of king and, and, while well, Nabonidus was gone, and so the only next position he could offer was third in the kingdom. So, so I guess that Daniel was not the third. Daniel at this point was not the third. I think. Well, he never became third, did he? It's hard to say. He became head of the magicians. He became head of all the wise men. You know, I think he was virtually what's called him chancellor of Babylon. But it's hard to say. He certainly wasn't royal, so he couldn't, you know, take a royal position undoubtedly. Now, it's interesting, it says the queen comes into the banquet hall, which implies, of course, the queen was not in the banquet hall, which implies that this is not Belshazzar's wife. Okay? How does that imply? Belshazzar's wife is undoubtedly there with his concubines in the banquet hall when this all occurred. Oh. So that, is not, that cannot be who he's referring to. He's referring to some other queen. Well, there's two other obvious possibilities. A, it could have been Belshazzar's mother, the queen mother, who was summoned to this. Okay? Or it could have been his grandmother, who would have been Nebuchadnezzar's aged wife. Those are the two possibilities that I think that we're left with. Now, 
if it was Belshazzar's mother, we have an interesting dilemma, I think, because I kept researching this and I found that not only she was, of course, obviously the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar and could remember some of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, but there's an interesting thing about her. Belshazzar, or she, was the high priestess of the moon god, Belshazzar's mom. So it makes you wonder, in the literature, since we know that that was her position, is she going to really likely be the kind of person that's going to say, oh, let me go get Daniel? She's pretty invested in the whole, you know, you know, Babylonian deity system herself, since she has temples built to herself as the priestess of the moon god. So more likely it was her grandma. So I think it's more like, can't prove it, but I think it's more likely it was grandma mm -hmm. that was called. Of course, the, 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 who would have known absolutely all about this, would have absolutely known Daniel very personally, spent years in service with him undoubtedly. And she still would have been called queen. And she would have been called the queen mother mm -hmm. still, okay? So at any rate, I think, I think that's probably what it means. Now, remember, from the time of Nebuchadnezzar's death, 23 years have passed. Daniel at this time, based on our calculations, would have been approximately 85 years old. Mm -hmm. All right? I think it's fair to say that Belshazzar had little connection with Daniel. Daniel probably, we don't know exactly, but he probably would have retired from public service some years before. I mean, most people are not going to be doing a whole lot of public service traveling around the kingdom at 85. I think he kind of is in a retirement role. I personally think, my opinion, that he's still instructing the Magi because what they have to know to show up at Christ's birth they have to be very well instructed in what's going to come. I think he that's the people he probably still probably spent time with and taught, you know, as kind of an aged scholar. Again, my opinion, but I think it's it's very possible. But Daniel, of course, is called again, and of course they find him somewhere and bring him into this banquet hall. Now they, of course, make the statement only that he, quote, has the spirit of the gods, because these people that are in this banquet hall don't know the living God like Nebuchadnezzar did. They have no real knowledge. A generation has gone by, actually two, actually, have gone by. It's now the grandson here. They've, you know, undoubtedly backslidden into this, into this whole system. Uh, and they don't know the Lord of the heaven and earth. Now, Belshazzar offers all sorts of presents in the third position of the empire to Daniel. I think it's interesting that as soon as Daniel looked at this and understood what was on the wall, he would quickly realize, you know, that really doesn't mean a whole lot, guys, because there isn't going to be a third position in a matter of, a matter of hours. Yeah. <laughs> not, not a big reward to me. It ain't going to exist real quickly, okay? Literally, hours, okay? Because it was that night that Cyrus marched into the city. But Daniel didn't know that, though, right? Didn't know what? Well, when he read the message. When he read the message. Yeah. Well, we'll get to the message next week. You'll see what, what he knew from the message, okay? No, he knew. As soon as he saw it, he knew what it said. But I'm going to show you why, why it is that they couldn't read it, but he could read it, okay? At least I'll give you a, a likely explanation of why. So I think it's interesting. We'll, we'll pick up starting next week uh, in verse 17. But Daniel comes in uh, with quite an attitude towards Belshazzar and the group. <laughs> He didn't pull any punches whatsoever, and basically, in so many words, tells Belshazzar that he's a punk, and he's in no he's in no way compares to his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> so, um, chapter one of Daniel, verse twenty-one, tells us that Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. Yes. 
Yeah, oh yeah. And he stayed at the corner. And he was a couple of years in Cyrus's uh, administration too. Cyrus knows of him and kind of puts him in a high position also. You know? Now, does he does he leave to Cyrus from Isaiah? Yes. Don't jump too far ahead now. <laughs> That's next week. <laughs> okay, we have a very good boy. Yeah, so by the way, let's could you close us in prayer for us for, for tonight? All right. Lord, thank you for this time and for um, our study and for your word. Thank you for letting us know your wonderful and complete and perfect plan. From the very beginning until the very end. And thank you that we are part of your plan. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for this night. Amen.